What a day this has been. What a red mood I'm in. Why it's almost like being a tough. Well done, well done. I'm gonna show the people at home how many people are here, because there are there are more than you'll be able to hear. So uh, we came here to say no woman has a penis. No man has a vagina. Oh, I've got a drum beat for that. Uh, there's no such thing as non binary. And transitioning children is profound abuse. Now, the reason we came to Cambridge is there were quite a lot of women who said it was so massively swamped with this ideology and they couldn't move for trans flags during the month of June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, or May. Um, but in those months in between, it was fine. So in, the, in Cambridge schools, like all schools across the country, and the cast review, as weak as it might be, is good news. But it just means that now we are telling those children who've been fed the lies that they are something called trans are now going to be martyrs uh, and they are apparently going to be living in misery until we can rush them through age 16 for cross-sex hormones. And you have to remember that when Cass was doing her report, many, many so-called gender clinics, uh, little small butchers, um, they wouldn't cooperate with any data whatsoever. So I don't think that the NHS is free of the activist plague. I think it is absolutely rampant with it. And so to try and get these changes, even if approved, because it's only a review, even if that's taken on board by the NHS, it's going to take a really long time before your NHS hospital and services are free from this activism. Because as soon as you just get one of these blinkered fools working in a hospital, working in your GP surgery, working in your school, working in your cancer clinics, any of these places these people work, they become centres of activism. Because that is the thing that they believe they, they are there to do. They are a bit like Jehovah's Witnesses, except they don't really knock. Um, they just turn up and make demands, and they use all language like um, bigot, um, supremacist, uh, Nazi, and all these words that so far have really begun to erode people's sense of what the truth is and what they can and cannot say. And so I just want all of you to accept by coming here today that you are going to get names being thrown at you but we're, many of us, I think, are children of 70s, 80s, maybe even 60s. And we had the rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I mean, you could take my job and I'll probably get the sack and maybe none of my friends will talk about talk to me anymore. But um, realistically, you just have to accept it and you have to try not to deny it because then you get into a serious conversation, and these are not serious accusations. These are not serious people that give up a Saturday to say, oh, there's some, there's some women who've got, I don't know, wrinkles on their faces. Oh, they're not like people anymore. So we'd like to come and stop them talking. Um, but for anybody walking past in this beautiful city, your children are being taught at school that they can choose their biological sex. Girls are being taught in schools that they don't really matter. And if a boy says he's a girl, he's allowed to use that female only space. So I, I just think you need to have a look. Quiet people talking about issues, overprivileged morons trying to stop us actually being able to speak. Um, but look, I'm still happy that they're that far away. And I hope anybody that's watching, if you would like to come down, it really is fine. You can come in from the entrance behind us. Um, and at the moment, um, they look about as serious as their flag. So 
you're more than welcome. Right, this is Let Women Speak. This is about giving women across the country who maybe can't make it to Hyde Park or just want to make the point here. So sometimes we go and there's absolutely hundreds of women and they come and they, they have something to say. Sometimes it's not so many. And what we do is we just break that silence and we just break the spell wherever it is. And this might be a little bit of both. So if you'd like to come and speak, uh, just put your hand up or step forward. Yes. education that day and they wouldn't until the 1940s. My point is over there isn't anything new. It's tale as old as time. We all know that when women gather now to talk or want to have a space of our own there will be men and some women who object. To quote Emmeline Pankhurst, when men come to disrupt women's meetings, they come in gangs, they sing and shout together and stamp their feet. Well, over there, it's the same old crusty misogyny with a new face. And it's a case of same shit, different century. Thank you. in the little live thing I just did on Twitter as I was walking, I was like, look at that man behind. Um, and actually he came as a parody. Uh, so he's wearing bright pink socks up to his knees and he's like, I want to play against cis women. <laughs> Rugby. Um, but he's so indistinguishable, even though he was like a massive character, like mockery of the whole thing. He, ge <laughs> he genuinely just looked like one of them. Um, which was uh, very interesting, but uh, it's, it's weird what's happening with girls. It, I sort of, I couldn't sleep last night and it just struck me, this whole thing of gender dysphoria, which is actually littered through the cast review. And I just don't think it exists. I think it's the same as anything else that impacts girls in particular, um, whether it's cutting and it's about control. So. If, you're, if you have an eating disorder, that might be the only thing that you control is how much you eat and you feel some power over that, that thing because you feel powerless. And I just think that if you're a girl and you don't assimilate well into what a girl behaves like or is supposed to be like, maybe other girls don't like you very much, maybe you don't really understand the small nuances and the little look that you might get that you're supposed to understand as girls, 
you're supposed to know that what the right thing to say is and how loud you can be and how quiet you should be and how smiley you should be, even how happy you should be, because that can really piss people off, or how confident you are. Any of those things that make you different means that you can be rejected from the main group. So why not reject yourself? Why not come out and not have to handle that rejection by pretending you're a boy? And I think it makes perfect sense. What doesn't make sense is that we would have a specialist service to somehow endorse and affirm that that is a real thing and that girls really can feel like boys and it isn't something displaced. Because you don't really feel like a boy. That's just the label you give your power when you can see that you can make this decision as opposed to anyone else. And I'm not a psychologist, but that makes perfect sense to me. I mean, I'm. I'm very often on the outside of cliques and groups, um, and that does mean that you get to make your own way. So for any girls listening, if you are on the outside, be thankful, because being on the inside means sometimes you have to give up a little bit of yourself. Um, okay, who would like to speak? here. It's certainly taken over the City Council yeah. where they passed a motion back in 2020 and I know that there are many people here who actually quietly or loudly like me have actually been very vocal against it. But this week the CAS reform has made the reality of what's been happening in those gender clinics clear to everyone in the country. It's really been quite amusing to see people backpedalling. Ruth Hunt today, for example. Yay, and bastard. all saying, well, we didn't really mean it. The problem is, we know they did. It's going to be a long fight to get this out of our institutions. But what we all know is that women are up to a fight. Yay. And that's all about. Wow, in Edinburgh because it was all such a close um, affair but thank you to all the local women in Cambridge uh, who've helped organise and thank you to our amazing stewards uh, as always They, they send three people. Um, so that is something that we really tr work hard to do because we don't expect women to have to come and be intimidated for speaking. We don't expect our stewards to ever have to come and have one single finger laid upon them. Uh, and that did happen in Birmingham, so nice one. Um, so we do try and keep everyone sane. And as I've said before, I've been assaulted too many times now, so I do actually have my own protection because the most dangerous time for me is trying to leave. And I don't know, I think I'm quite recognisable recognize these days. Um, you know, the block colour is a great idea, but it does mean I could be spotted from a country mile. And there's not too many slightly oversized Barbara Windsors walking around in onesies. So,
So who are the Kite Trust? Yeah. Well, they're Cambridgeshire's leading LGBTQ plus organisation. They were originally set up to support lesbian, gay, young people, and their primary aim now is to spread gender ideology, and our institutions are funding them. So let's look at the ways it's done. Firstly, there's the county-funded Trans Toolkit for Schools and Colleges, an FOI to Cambridgeshire County Council, highlighted that the Kite Trust and Brighton and Hove Council were the only two groups consulted for advice. The toolkit is written by the Safeguarding Education Team, endorsed by the CEO, disseminated by the council, and points users towards the council PSHE unit, where a named advisor is available to offer support and guidance to schools. The council state the Trans Toolkit is not policy. However, information from the toolkit is evident throughout numerous school policies and practices. In 2023, councilmen together wrote to specific members of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough councils and raised, con raised concerns about the toolkit. They failed to get a response. You would assume that the safeguarding team would contain specialists who were alert to attempts to subvert or remove the boundaries society has agreed to place around children and would do everything possible to ensure that they were providing a balanced, well-checked document to schools. You may also assume that once it became clear the advice they were providing could create conflict between groups of children, parents, families and schools, that the team would go back to the drawing board and question the wisdom of the advice. Instead, they appear to have thrown their hands up in the air before writing the misleading, children, it's not a safeguarding issue. Despite being published after the interim CAS report, the toolkit disregards all of the evidence-based recommendations made. The interim CAS report clearly asserted that social transition is not a neutral act. The Kite Trust opposed this view. They state social transition is not a precursor to medication, therefore no restrictions should be imposed. The Trust goes so far as suggesting that if necessary, adults collude in keeping social transition secret from parents. How has the county's own safeguarding protocol ended up ceding ground to a lobby group? More recently, the Kite Trust publicly rejected the government's well-received proposal that offered guidance to schools and colleges for gender questioning children. Local schools have been lobbied extensively and advised that they should reject the guidance and not abide by its recommendations. The Kite Trust promotes and profits from the notorious Rainbow Flag Award scheme. The scheme promotes the idea that it's possible to change sex. They use sex-based stereotypes related to personality, hairstyles and clothing to suggest that a child may be trans. Many schools run weekly LGBTQ plus groups. Some promote external clubs for 13 to 25 years that are run in conjunction with the Kite Trust. My own town disguised the age range of their life, Pride Youth Group though, which is open for those of 14 plus. The difference between a 13 and 25 year old is vast. One is a school child, the other an adult who may be working. The young teenagers may be questioning life or may already be socially affirmed. The adults could be taking cross-sex hormones or could have begun surgically modifying their bodies. The highly sexualised environment that some children have been exposed to may also be aiding the promotion and glorification of the pathway to body modification. Yet we're supposed to believe that this mix mixing of ages and stages does not influence or facilitate the progression from social to medical. The Kite Trust website highlights their funders, South County District Council, the Co-op, the Health Lottery, the UK Youth Fund and Children in Need. The Police and Crime Commission have even chucked them a couple of quid in the past. Maybe it's time the Trust funders took a deeper look at the message being promoted as it's difficult not to conclude that the Kite Trust mission is not about excellence, safe care or support for any LGBTQ plus child, but is in fact focused on spreading of the ideology that brings in financial reward and pumps up their reserves, allowing more children to be brought into the fold. Those attending Let Women Speak will continue to raise our concerns about the encroachment of gender ideology and its impact on children and young people. We'll be called transphobic or worse by the Kite Trust and their allies, but what they won't mention is that we're rocking a very lucrative boat and it really is no surprise that they want us silenced. But women will speak. Yeah. Thank you, Someone was offering me sweets there and I, I don't know where they got the idea that I would eat any. Um, everywhere we go, everywhere we go, there are a disproportionate number 
of LGBT groups. And when I say LGBT, I think we all know we mean T. Uh, because I don't think they had so much funding and there weren't so many. It wasn't quite the cash cow it is these days. Um, there's a lot of money coming into this. Um, in some places we go, each person who identifies as trans, whatever that might mean, but these people that utter this nonsense from their mouths, they're sometimes funded by four different groups overlap, just for these one individuals. And I'm sure it will be the same everywhere we go, that there is an, an absolute industrial kind of link from convincing a child that they are trans, to putting them into these groups at schools, rainbow groups, LGBT groups, groups where girls are told the kind thing to do is to accept that some little girls have penises and to accept these boys into their spaces. And it just follows that if you are invested in any way, shape or form of words like gender dysphoria, or trans, or non-binary, if there's some way of making money from that, why wouldn't you want kids to identify in that, in that way? Why wouldn't you want to pull them through? I mean, it's a lifetime, right? It's a lifetime of this bonkers affirmation, uh, drugs, surgeries, and the CAS review comes, and what we know is that Chelsea and Westminster Hospital uh, plans to do up to 200, and I think I'm not exaggerating, I think it's a lot more than this actually, so I'm being quite conservative. I mean, I get accused of that all the time anyway. Uh, but I think I'm being quite conservative with the numbers, but 200... Oh, hello. You, Tanya. Hi. <laughs> um, um, they're going to do about 200 phalloplasties. Now, if you don't know what a phalloplasty is, it means removing the flesh of your arm to fashion a penis, take some, take a nice big bit of flesh off your thigh to make up your arm because penises don't have hair on them, so your arm's less hairy. Well, unless you really are a man, and then they're quite, they're quite hairy. Um, but I, look, I don't have a penis. I just understand they're a little more sensitive than my forearm, um, and I think they do a totally different job than my arm. So the NHS is funding this. I mean, I think it would be interesting to see just how much money the NHS has spent. Because when I looked about five or six years ago, it was about 25 million. So I think now, this, this place, this, this um, Mengel um, butcher um, gender-affirming surgery place, where they'll be butchering vulnerable women, uh, they need nurses that specialise in repairing dead flesh flesh that doesn't fuse that's part of the thing that they will do um, and I'm sure they must be sort of putting up some lawsuit protective sort of policies in because I don't know if you've seen what a phalloplasty looks like but often they require numerous corrective surgeries to even allow somebody to urinate they are really dangerous I mean who knew that you couldn't actually make proper body parts out of other body parts apart from all of us so they, they knew this they know that it doesn't work they know that uh, it doesn't do anything apart from you know if, if mentally you're satisfied with a bit of your body that doesn't work and has no function besides looking like something that it might represent I'd say that you are insane and I'd say that probably you are satisfied with that I've seen a girl after 32 surgeries, including correcting, urinating from her anus, uh, just making sure there's no small children around, uh, but urinating from her anus and not being able to actually go to the toilet at all. She stayed in the hospital a year for her 32 corrective surgeries, come outside, go into a public restroom, come back in her car and cry with joy that she stood up to have a wee. We have she-wees in this country, um, and it might be a bit black humour to laugh at that, but if that is your goal, I think you can be helped way before you get to the point of slicing up your body. Way before. Okay, who would like to speak? Yes.
Lewis Carroll. Hey! And I'm a retired educational psychologist. About seven years ago, before I retired, myself and two other colleagues went down to London to speak with the General Secretary of the Association of Educational Psychologists. Is that better? No. No? Is that better? I've got a kiss. Is that better? Um, about seven years ago, myself and two other colleagues went down to London to meet with the General Secretary of the Association of Educational Psychologists, our trade union. And we spent about two hours going through the concerns we had that we were reading about and understanding to do with gender ideology. Fast forward to last month when the AEP, the Association for Educational Psychologists, published a consultation that they held for their members. And it is overwhelmingly a pile of absolute tut. <laughs> Even though there are educational psychologists who are quietly working in the background to turn this around. Those, like many other institutions, are captured by those in positions of power, institutional power. The point I'm making today is that even though all these institutions including that of educational psychology need to be challenged the fight is far from over and like a previous speaker said this is where the real real struggle takes place if you have any connection either professionally or through family with educational psychologists, don't assume that they know what they're doing. Don't assume that they are very clever because anybody who starts from the premise that a child can be born in the wrong body is on a hiding to nothing. They are wicked, wicked fools. the trans activists um, they're keeping up with the drumming uh, something happened just now where they started really drumming a lot um, I don't know what it was I we couldn't see but it must have been really really exciting um, I wonder what they were doing they were talking about trans joy because nothing says joy like coming out to scream at women who want to speak I mean I don't know about you but if my husband wants to make a really nice evening of us, we just we just shout at each other, quite angry, over each other, and we, we call it joy. Um, but they are very, very joyful. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't, I've just seen my, the LWS stewards just walk across. They are, they are women who've had teenagers. Um, <laughs> That is, that look there, both of them walking across it, and that look there was, I've just heard something break in the house. Uh, or, or that moment that, that we do is, we're, I don't think men can hear the tone, but women can hear the tone before your children are about to kill each other. You know that sort of, it's escalating, it's escalating, and then there's, oh Christ, someone's going to get hit. Um, that was that look. Um, or a children's party look, where you know, one girl is going to push in. It's that look when you know you're going to have to come and intervene. But it was beautiful. I think that's what makes Let Women Speak so special, is many of us have the don't mess with us look, and we've got it down to a T. Anyway, I could, I could go on, but it, it's wildly entertaining from here. Okay, who would like to speak? Just 
say the guy behind who's trying to disrupt her with music, he's standing on his own and the song is All the Lonely People. <laughs> Hello everyone, right, I work in the NHS and I'm here partly because I want people to come and talk to me and if you're interested in joining some kind of group who, a sex realism group, come and talk to me. Um, hopefully something will happen fairly soon. Um, so I, my experience working in the NHS uh, over the years, I've been, in, been working in Cambridge, I've just been really distressed by the number of young people usually. Uh, you know, the tall, skinny students, uh, blokes, who want to be called Lily and want to grow a pair of breasts. And I actually feel desperate for them because they're not getting the help they need. Similarly, I've seen quite a lot of young women um, who, who've had mastectomies or are desperate to have mastectomies. You know, uh, people who've had testosterone given to them via their parents getting it shipped in from I don't know where. Because these are kids. Um, and it's just the appalling waste of human life. These kids who are getting these, uh, these wrong sex tr treatments and this belief that somehow this is going to sort out their pain. And it's really, really difficult being on the, uh, the NHS side of it when you're, being, you're between sort of these really distressed kids and you know they've got nowhere to go and it's really not the right thing for them. So there's, there's some of us who want to do something about it and uh, please come and talk to me uh, if you're happy to hand over name and phone number then I can let you know when something does happen. Um, so, and particularly with the mastectomies, I mean, it's something that's really, it's very personal because I've got a family history full of people with breast cancer. And this idea that you can just throw away your breasts and you just, and, and that's okay. Um, when, you know, people have, who've had mastectomies, they lose the sensation in their chest. There's the, the kind of sexual function that you lose. There's the, the there's the personhood. There's, there's, there's something really powerful about that. Uh, that loss um, uh, on, on the women's side <laughs> um, and I don't know how these young people can possibly think that that's the right thing and there's a couple um, I used to I used to know um, when I was working a little bit outside Cambridge um, a, a, a lesbian couple and one of them had decided to become trans um, and I think it was probably because it, became, it meant that they were more accepted as a, as a couple um, in this you know, there's still parts of the, of the country that are really homophobic. And so when one of them became a trans-identified female, um, that was kind of okay now. Uh, they were a, 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 a couple that, that the rest of the community could deal with. But the scars on the poor woman's chest from the mastectomy was just awful. Um, right, so, you know, there's parts of the NHS I'd really like to have a go at, you know, the GMC and um, the, the Royal College of General Practitioners, particularly after their cowardice around the CAN-SG conference that happened a couple of weeks ago. Now, I know that there's people here that don't think that the CAN-SG was uh, strong enough in their condemnation of, of um, the first do no harm uh, uh, conference that they were doing. Um, but actually, it's a start, and it's. I think we should be really supporting uh, parts of the NHS and, um, and the, the health sector that are really uh, wanting to uh, make changes. So anyway, come and have a, um, a chat, a talk to me, and if you're happy to give me names and numbers, then I can let you know. I just want to say on the the criticism of that particular event. As an activist, I've got to always be asking for more from people who have known for a really long time what's been going on. And I think it's, look, I've, I've talked to some people really sort of integral who've been in this fight for a very long time who were medics. And I think the cowardice from leadership has let everybody down who works in this area in the NHS because most GPs damn well know that there's no such thing as changing sex. And not most, all GPs, anybody who's got language skills, who actually can speak and talk, um, and even some that don't, uh, are perfectly aware that you can't change sex. And there's just been this culture of bullying and silencing 
I was on a bus in 2015 um, on a trip with my daughter and the woman I was sat next to, this is 2015, the woman I was sat next to was in charge of community nursing for the whole of the southwest of England. And she was rewriting the policies then to allow men who call themselves women to visit, visit vulnerable women in their own homes without chaperones. So men on their own with women in the NHS uh, with no safeguarding whatsoever. And that was 2015. I hadn't even fully got to the point where I knew that children were being harmed by that then. I think probably like many of you, you go, oh, that's happening. Well, they won't, you know, they won't, they won't put rapists in, in women's prisons. And then you find out, yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. And well, they won't put men in women's wards. And then you find out, yeah, they do. And you may have forgotten some of the early stories about this, but I think it was about 2017, 2018, a woman went into acute mental health ward and the reason she went in is because she was frightened men were gonna kill her. I would imagine it was a, a re-traumatizing of sort of childhood trauma, re-experiencing that. And she went into this ward and she said that next to her was a bloke in this women-only ward. And when she told the nurses she was afraid, she got recorded on her hospital notes. Like, remember, it's an acute mental health ward with women with psychosis. And she was recorded as, as a bigot and a transphobe by those nurses. Fast forward, like, five years, and she calls me and she says, you know the man I said was on that ward and all of us women were really afraid. I said, yeah, and she said, he's just been caught with 80,000 images of child rape on his computer. So all those women did, weren't just afraid because he was a man. They were afraid because they knew what sort of man he actually was, which should have been indicative on the fact that he pretended to be a woman and went in a women's acute psychosis mental health ward. And these women are the most vulnerable women in the NHS. They are just castigated, they are not believed, they are bad witnesses, they are terrible victims. Uh, nobody wants to believe them. Who wants to believe a woman who's had serious amounts of trauma, who perhaps changes her mind, who gets vulnerable and gets frightened and gets afraid and changes her story? Why wouldn't you chuck a man next to those very vulnerable women and then just ignore them when they complain? And worse, silence them with accusations like bigot and transphobe. And that's happening all over the NHS, which is why they put that bloke who has a nurse fetish and dresses up in PVC nurse gear, and they put him as the head of an acute mental health ward with women with psychosis. And the first thing he did was he moved his bed, down, and he moved his office down to where they sleep. And I watched a thing with three women and him all talking about how wonderful that was that he did that so he could be close to the women every second that they might need him. So I just think there's so much that's gone on in the NHS that we absolutely categorically have to stop it yesterday. Um, yes, who wants to speak? I must say I'm loving the t-shirts today, ladies. <laughs> Um, I've watched, I think I've watched all, Kelly, of your LWS so events. <laughs> There's always somebody talking about autism, so here I am. Um, I just want to mention language and how we, we absolutely have to be able to speak freely. And that means that carries a risk of offence and of, of offending anybody. Um, and I think we need to understand what this ideology is asking, you know, demanding of everyone. Um, it appears to be telling you, like the really famous now, Orwell, quote, to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears, the party's final, most essential command. This requires mental gymnastics before you even formulate your thoughts into words. The thought process is stifled and corrupted. Dialogue is impeded and we find ourselves choosing instead not to speak at all. Perhaps this was the aim all along. This is damaging enough for most of us. Now try, if you can, to imagine the rules of the social game are totally alien to you. Your ability to read cues is severely impaired. Those mental gymnastics are already required every time you interact with others. 
after growing up with these barriers which contrary to popular belief don't really get that much easier with age and maturity you tend to choose between the anguish of questioning all your interactions to decide whether or not you breach some social expectation or withdrawing completely and not speaking much at all this is the reality of many autistic people now try to consider what this ideology demands from these people who already carry a really heavy burden on top of that puzzle of everyday social engagement they have the added requirement of rejecting the evidence of their eyes and ears in order to be approved and this approval isn't a guarantee as the final slap in their face is the rules and the approved language keep changing the result by and large will be that we effectively silence and marginalize the autistic population a group that are already very much forgotten, sidelined and diminished. Tolerance means accepting that you might have to tolerate being offended. Thank you very much for that. Um, if you were nervous it didn't show, you did really well, so thanks so much. Uh, who else would like to speak? they have about anything other than trans uh, because what you'll find is that they don't and it started off as a good thing I think it was a great idea diversity and inclusion to address some of the imbalances uh, of course we want people with disabilities to be able to access a full and healthy life with jobs that they adore and can do um, and so it's great what a great idea it's not about that anymore it's a bit like trains covered in trans and pride colours, they still don't have platforms that people in wheelchairs can actually access. Uh, I follow a few um, disability rights activists, which I'm, I'm terribly ashamed to say have been totally co-opted by this LGBT idea of inclusion. And it does make me wonder what they think is happening where they go 
and there for the 15th time this year they've meticulously planned their journeys they've made sure every single station has got a ramp waiting and some staff waiting and then you you see them online complaining that somebody didn't turn up so their sort of long convoluted journey that should take us able-bodied people about 45 minutes can take two and a half hours and they still get totally let down by that system and then I don't think his voice is broken yet. I couldn't really hear him. I think he said, Woman in pink, I want to, and then I just. Uh, I think he said, I love you, you're amazing. That reminds me, we should fund NHS dentists. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so I'm reminded that sometimes you see these people and they might still have a pride flag or colors in their bio, but then they're talking about not being able to get on a train because somebody's let them down as part of the journey. So diversity and inclusion doesn't really mean that anymore. It means a, a really easy way of pretending that you're doing something nice whilst doing absolutely nothing whatsoever. Um, and that's, I think, why these people in councils are wasting about 40 to 45,000 pounds of your council tax on a yearly basis. And often there's about three at the council and they're not doing the job to the women, which reminds me, party of women uh, has, they're all up north actually, we have five candidates uh, who are able to make it uh, for the next election by the skin of our team. And these are going to be the first because many of the women who put themselves forward, their council elections aren't until next year. And so we'll hopefully have another crop by then. But this is just the first kind of little group of women that are solely, their sole purpose is to change the, the conversations in councils from ones that don't consider women's safety or child safeguarding at all to ones where those questions are raised and those issues are discussed. Because if you have a look at any of these council meetings, they just pretend that women don't exist when they go through their policies. Um, and I'm hoping that we can start raising the issue of sex discrimination when it comes to policies that come in place that impact indirectly and directly impact women because I think that's how we should fight this we should use the Equality Act which is in my mind not fit for purpose but we should use it while we've got it and we should really test in the balance of rights according to the Equality Act who wins because at the moment it seems to be men in dresses over women in comfortable trousers so um, anyway who would like to speak
and that will happen. The CAS review it is not the beginning of public scrutiny, and it's, sorry, it's not the end of public accountability and scrutiny. It is just the beginning. And now I come here to ask you all to join us in demanding a public inquiry. Yeah. Write your MP. Ask them for a public inquiry. We really need to get to the bottom of what has gone on in education that has contributed to the appalling things we've seen in the CAS review. Everybody must be held to account. We need the Department for Education looking at. We need Ofsted looking at. We need the NSPCC looking at. We need every single person who has failed in their duty of care to the vulnerable children held to account. It is not acceptable to be in a job that requires you to safeguard children and not do your duty. So we're asking everyone here, join us. Write your MP, demand that public inquiry, check your local schools, demand that they are safeguarding all of the children. And thank you very much. Uh, for those of you that don't follow my uh, YouTube, I recently went into a school um, and I watched two safeguarding leads lie to a parent's face. I mean, like not a little lie either, big fat lies. Lies like, oh no, that book's not about gender identity. No, 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 we're not t teaching any of this trans stuff in school. And then the parent said, but that's the point of the book. It's about a crayon. I can't be bothered. It's such a convoluted, stupid idea. But essentially, it's about one crayon thinks it's a boy, but it's the colour of the crayon is a girl, and she wants to, whatever. Uh, and it's all about stereotypes and what boys should like and girls should like. And then the safeguarding lead said, I know some schools might use it like that. So I said, well, who recommended the book? Where'd you get the book? No outsiders. So the No Outsiders uh, little grooming scam, um, when you walk into a No Outsiders school, and they're very proud of this because I can only get to the point that, that a lot of people go into teaching in these sort of schools and they're cowards and they're stupid. Uh, and I know that's not very nice and we should all support our teachers, but a lot of these young teachers, this is what happens, this is what's happened in these schools. For the last five to seven years, maybe ten years, education uh, uh, training, so universities have been training and grooming teachers. And then those activist teachers go into schools and they get employed because, frankly, we don't fund our education system enough. So it's better to get a t cheap, naive activist teacher than keep an experienced teacher, let's face it, in these days is probably completely jaded, overworked and really fed up with the education system anyway. So they're quite happy to leave. And I think we're finding that like the police, for example, police officer gets trained, they might stay in the police force for about seven years. So we really are losing in all our public services our more experienced, resilient uh, colleagues. They're just they're just leaving the professions. So these activists then go into schools and then they, they groom the children. And then they get in and then the, the older teachers, often women, uh, they don't seem to be able to stand their ground. They seem to just give up like completely wet lettuces. They just, these teachers come in, they say, hey, we should have this in. And they go, oh yeah, I don't really understand that. Yeah, let's just get them in. Let's just get them in. And then parents don't know what they're doing because no one tells us. And then the occasional parent sticks their head above the parapet and they are treated like a troublemaker. And you're a little bit worried, do I go in and say something? Or is that teacher then going to be a little bit more pissed off with my child? So I went into my own kids' school and they said, we don't really know the terminology. And I said, well, don't use it. If you don't, if you don't know what it means, don't use it. And then they said, so we're bringing in gendered intelligence. And this is what I said, I want you all women just to practice. Oh, no, you're not. No, no. No, you won't be doing that. And she said, well, and I said, well, like you do with your own children, because 
I said so is quite a good one. Uh, but then I just told her a little bit about the organisation. And I said that if you do that, then I will see fit to make sure every single parent understands what you're teaching. And here at Let Women Speak, what we're doing with our locals is producing a leaflet to go and leaflet outside of schools. Because no one wants you to do that. I don't mean go and harass them like five-year-olds. I mean, wait until drop-off is done and get their mums on the way out. And I say mums because I'm moderately sexist and I appreciate that it's mostly women that drop off their kids. Uh, and also just before pick-up when women are congregating in the, in the playground ready for the school gates to open to pick up their children. Uh, I'm talking about putting leaflets on cars and let's, try to shame, let's start to shame the schools that promote this ideology so it becomes an embarrassment and a big fat headache to do so. But, but know this, the teachers see parents as contemptuous. They think that you're a big pain in the arse who doesn't really know how to raise children like they do. And that's because they've been told this. This is not ideas that they've come up with all on their own. Uh, they've been educated and, and groomed at their universities to think this is true. And I think as a society, we've been groomed to think that parents are often quite dangerous. Um, even though there's very few parents that are really dangerous, and you know, we all have bad days. But I mean truly dangerous parents. Um, and I think that we have been taken, our children have taken from us um, more and more, which is why you often see campaigns with political parties wanting to get even low paid women back to work as soon as humanly possible. And bear with me, because if you want to go to work, I'm all, I'm, go, for, go for it. If you're happier at work than looking after your children, then that sounds terrible. I don't mean it. It's no, there's no judgment. If you'd rather go to work than stay home all day, then that's entirely up to you. And some people will have jobs that they adore, that it's absolutely imperative that after about six months or a year they go back. But that is not the case for most women. Most women want to stay at home. And at the moment, there is this push to sort of say that you're only valuable if you actually put your child, if you pay another woman a low paid wage to go and earn your own low paid wage in a job that you don't even like. And if that sounds a bit trad wifey, I'm just going to say that I actually think, I believe that this is what women want. It's not about returning to work as soon as humanly possible. And it's not about, you know, children don't need, we are now almost being led to believe that children need to be away from you and in nursery formal education at the age of like three. And that's, that's just not the case. Um, my mother always worked. She sort of did cleaning beginning and end of day and then my grandmother looked after me so I was very lucky. But I just went to a play group. I think many of us of our generation just kind of went to a play group because our, our mothers either did part-time work or... But we didn't go into formal education with now activists and there are now activists in nurseries. I hear from women all the time. So it's not just once they get to school. They're also being asked, little kids are being asked about their gender identity before they can even write their names. So just be fair warned um, that this is happening everywhere. Everywhere that used to be parental loca um, loco parentis, which is like parent when you're not there, an assumed role. It is now more like a loco teacher or loco state funded employer. You're like seen as the secondary raiser of your child. And I think that's all part of this. That's how this has ha been allowed to manifest because we are being totally um, disabused of our responsibility of our own children. because there are so many other people who can say things so much better. No. However, however, in the light of the fantastic police present here today, I thought I would just share with you a letter I wrote to Daryl Preston, 
who is standing for PCC in Cambridgeshire. I also copied it to the other two. He's a Tory. I copied it to the Labour and to the Lib Dem. I can't remember their names, but it hardly matters. Here's what I wrote. Dear Mr. Preston, I'm sure you are aware of the Let Women Speak event, which will be taking place this coming Saturday on Parker's Peace. These events have been held all over the country and abroad for some time now. Each time women meet in public to express support for single sex spaces or hold conferences to explore feminist issues, there are those who come to protest. These protesters have been getting more and more violent and more bold at each event. Yes. As a minimum, they carry messages with placards with violent and obscene, often badly spelled, messages such as decapitate turfs and dykes love trans dick. <laughs> Women have been physically attacked or chased. The, well, sorry. Women, yeah. Women have been physically attacked or chased down the street by aggressive men. The police, in response, in almost all cases, have been to kettle the women and let the protesters drown out the speeches with sound systems, whistles and drums. These protesters, and I'm going to say bloody protesters, are allowed to control the event. The local trans rights activists in Cambridge have been openly advertising their, in their intentions to disrupt, disrupt Saturday's events and openly brazenly threaten violence. You and all other candidates in this year's PCC election promise to reduce violence against women and girls. Will you come good on this promise? Please, can I have an assurance that Cambridgeshire Police will robustly protect the almost all-female attendees against the almost all-male protesters? And I see they sent three PCOs. I got a response which basically said, well, we don't get involved in operations. We just get paid 73 grand a year, that's mine. For Sorry, uh, that's it, that's it. But, but we're having PCC elections all over the country in the next few months. Make sure you ask your PCC candidates what they intend to do about children like that who want to stop grown-ups like us just meeting. Thanks. <laughs> Lovely to hear those very female voices over there, isn't it? What do we do when uh, when women speak? Well, we come out and try and intimidate women with violence. Uh, I think it's that. It's not very... Uh... <laughs> Apparently, I'm a wanker. <laughs> well, some of us still got the equipment, boys. <laughs> but it is funny that I mean we must all just just for a moment just take a moment turn around give a wave <laughs> so for those people watching we just turned around and waved and they um, they were just a little bit silent what we were doing um, there's some really old, there's like older men there. There's a guy there with a Unite flag with a beard and a badly painted t-shirt. Um, he looks about 60 uh, from here. He looks about 60, his beard's completely grey. Why do you think he's here? Why is he here standing with a load of kids? Um, and what you'll find if you watch these men closely, you often find these older men whispering in the ears of the younger people there they sort of orchestrate it they often need the chance they they encourage people um there's something 
There's something sinister about them, but they all they they often look like the orchestrators of these things. So just keep an eye on him. I'm pretty sure I've seen him in Newcastle. Maybe he travels around wherever women are talking. Um, maybe he just does that. Uh, That was a very loud voice for a small child. Okay, who else would like to speak? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? I, uh, uh, I haven't made a speech, so I might be a bit rumbling. But um, I just wanted to mention a few things. So, talking about the cast review, which a few people have mentioned, um, it doesn't talk about schools very much, but it does say a few little things. Uh, it makes really clear that parents should be actively involved in decision making and that social transitioning is an active intervention. So it's gone further than the interim report, which may have sig significant effects on a young person's psychological functioning and longer term outcomes. And the report describes the need for clinical involvement in the decision making process on social transitioning and adds, this is not a role that can be taken by staff without appropriate clinical training. So this is the time, everyone, for the paper trail. Okay, hold your local schools to account. Those schools that are trying to trans your kids, I'm looking at you, Philip Brown Colchester, let's name and shame, phoning up parents, trying to persuade them to change their kids' pronouns and their names in the register. If one parent says no, you try their next parent. That's the safeguarding lead. Write to them, ask them what their policy is on social transition. Ask them what, um, what, what consultation they've done with parents. Ask them what consultation they've done with students. Ask them what equality impact assessments they've done. Their public sector equality duty. Have they taken into account the re 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 relevant protective characteristics? And most importantly, have they got it on their risk register? Because once you know about this stuff, you're liable. Okay, nobody can say, if you've written to them and told them about this, nobody can say we didn't know anymore. Okay, so Golden Earth, you're, you're personally liable for this stuff and do you know about it? What are you doing about it? Let's not let them get away with this. We all know what kind of kids are vulnerable to this kind of stuff. And it, uh, here I've got something about the uh, Time to Think by Hannah Barnes. If you haven't read it, get hold of it. But it's all about, you know, the vulnerable children the, uh, on the autistic spectrum. Uh, be, uh, ch children in care, uh, 10 times more likely to than the national average child of a registered sex offender as a parent, all that. We all know this. Don't let the schools get away with it. Because as uh, other speakers have said, we're hoping that um, a public inquiry is coming. So let's get that paper trail. I'm getting my paper trail together for my. Uh, my local, uh, my, lo my local area, which is Colchester, the council, all the councillors that are going along with it, if you've even got the local theatre trans in kids behind the parents' bike. I've written to it, yeah, I write to you and I write to you and write to you, you ignore me, but I've got the paper trail now. And, <laughs> yeah, it's all right. And, um, yeah. And look at your local organisations, your local TQ Plus organisations, where are they? Well, where will you find them? You'll find them everywhere where vulnerable children are. They're in the children's homes. They're in CAMs. They're in the domestic violence shelters. And look at all the people behind them. All the people are on the school governing boards and on the board of the local theatre. Also work at the uh, domestic violence shelters. All those people who know how to make the money go around. Just get your paper trail together, because I've got mine ready to go uh, for, for a public inquiry. Uh, also, I just wanted to mention another website which is called givingisgreat.com. It's a really good website for looking at who's funding who and where all the funding's coming from. National uh, National Lottery Community Fund. Well, just go on givingisgreat.com and look on donors and then search on causes, LGBTQ, staggering amounts. Okay, so we need to start holding these people to account as well. Do they know what they're funding? If they're still funding this stuff, have they got their, you know, have they got their public liability insurance in place for the future? Okay, so thanks for listening. All right, thanks. Um, what? What's it called, that website? Oh, uh, givingisgreat.org, not .com. Givingisgreat.org. So everybody at home, givingisgreat.org. Um, 
Some of the posts, I know, I, I hate to talk about the trans activists, but it is funny. There's a poster down there. They look like they've spent ages on it, but the lettering's too small. I can't read any of it. Um, so, but it, like they've drawn a big sort of tunnel. I think it's something about vision and themselves. Um, but yeah, there's, there's some great, go and have a look at the gallery. It's, um, it's a bit like a circus. Go and read some of the signs, but uh, the writing is very small, so sorry chaps. Okay, who else would like to speak? Yes. Hello. <laughs> so this is my first time coming to a Let Women Speak event. I'm a bit nervous, so forgive me. Um, this is a bit of a personal story. Um, about 18 months ago, I've got four daughters, three of whom are uh, teens, uh, around that age. Um, and about 18 months ago, one of, of the school called me in to say that one of them was now identifying as non-binary, which was a shock to me, a complete shock. It came out of the blue. Um, so I went in. I had lots of mermaids, literature, and the gender-bred person shoved at me. Now luckily, I had been piqued a little bit before then by, well, stuff. <laughs> um, I'd seen what happened to Posey, to Kelly, sorry, in New Zealand. All that absolute horrendousness. Um, and it took all my fortitude not to go <laughs> in front of these teachers. Um, but my daughter was pushed towards uh, a trans-identified female that was in her class. There's a little group of them pushed towards, and I watched her mental health go down the toilet. For the last year, she has really struggled. Sorry, um, and it was it was horrendous because I made sure to tell her that you know she can think what she wants, she can wear what she wants. It doesn't matter. But she is female. She will always be a female. Whatever she does in this life will be affected by her femaleness which she seemed to take on board. Um, and about six months ago, things came to a head where the group of trans-identified children she was with were absolutely toxic, completely toxic. And uh, we had a, a non-contact order, all sorts happened. And she was removed, they were removed from her, she was removed from them. Um, and I watched as her mental health came up again, came up again. <laughs> that she was wearing more feminine clothes my legs shaking sorry <laughs> um and i said where are we with this so let's be honest i don't mind what you say i just where are we just said, honey i wanted to fit in i'm not non-binary anymore I'm not. my heart softens because yeah non-binary is bs <laughs> women are we're so special we're female women are adult human females um, and my daughter's over there. Um, she's come with me today to see, to see what women are up against. Um, and it's just, it's just amazing. The, the lengths they go to and the things they put on their side, it's, it's horrendous. But there we are, we have to fight back against it and do all we can to show that women are adult human females. No woman has a penis. No man has a vagina. Thank you very much for listening. Um, so, I guess we ought to thank the trans activist mob in New Zealand uh, for coming out that day because that did make it global news. And what, what the trans activists don't realise when they come out and protest us is they make us a little more interesting because normally, uh, being middle-aged women, nobody listens to a word we say. We're kind of invisible. Uh, even if we wear a shed load of makeup and bleach our hair, um, we're still very, very invisible in society, which is when you speak up at work or you're in a meeting where there's men in the meeting, uh, you can say something and it's kind of moderately ignored and then a man can say something a version of what you've just said um, and then people applaud him like he's just invented Christmas. Uh, in fact, that's kind of what's happened in this movement. We've been saying stuff for ages. Uh, radical feminists have been saying stuff since the 70s. 
Um, but then other women have sort of really brought this to the fore over the last uh, decade, and I've been doing it since about 2015. Um, and then some men come along and they go, oh, <coughs> I don't think women do have penises. And everyone goes, oh my God, where, why hasn't anyone said this before? Where have all the feminists been? Where have all the women been all this time? I haven't heard anything. And I just want to say, just tune in to higher pitches. Um, maybe it's that. I mean, I remember Thatcher, who obviously I'm, she's my idol, that's a joke. Um, I remember, actually she was when I was eight. We had, a, we had a female monarch and we had a female prime minister. And I think what well, that gave women, little girls, in the 70s and 80s is an idea that we really could be anything. Um, and my daughter, I remember her saying when she was about three that she couldn't be the prime minister. Don't ask me why we were having that conversation. I think she just had a bee sting or something. I have no idea. But we were having this conversation about something and she said she couldn't be the prime minister um, because she's not a boy. And I never thought that. Like, women of our generation, I don't think we know how much impact having a queen and a, a prime minister, whether you liked her or not, who was a female, that really made a difference to us and that gave us an idea of what we could be. Maybe, just maybe, if the famous lesbians on the television like Sandy Toxvig, um, Sue Perkins, and other women who should be, who should be amazing role models that you can achieve and be funny and charismatic and actually not have to be heterosexual you don't have to be kind of a you don't have to do this um to actually be valued as a female there's other ways to be a woman uh if they weren't so dick pandering they would be amazing role models for young lesbians um you kind of wonder who they're I was trying to think about this the other day. Who is there who's both making a fortune, is a lesbian, and hasn't uh, surrendered to the cult? I don't think there is anyone, but... Uh, so if you're, if you're looking for a... Who? Martina. Oh, Martina. Yeah, but she's a talented woman. She's not just on the telly. So Martina, you. Um, although I think she did say about that guy that was a pretended to be a woman that she did support him didn't she but she's great now uh, so that's fine okay who else would like to speak uh, any trans activist uh, yes. this woman is not a trans activist she put her hand up before huge amount to say but I just wanted to say a little bit about what trans has meant to me. Um, I didn't know anything about this till about a year ago when I came across Kelly J on Spotify and then mum and I came to our first Let Women Speak in Hyde Park in June. Yay. Anyway, so adult life has not quite worked out for me. I've sort of had a failure to get my shit together. But the trans business has given me a di dilemma because I have two younger brothers and, and them and their partners are both trans sympathetic and part of me thinks I sh should tell them but the other part feels really really superior and I don't really want this moment to end so anyway we're, we're still still working on that and it's a long time and it's, a, it's quite a good feeling and then the, um, the other thing I sort of came to an understanding of why although I was sort of acting utterly moronic for many years. God didn't answer my prayers and, and that was because there there are a lot of actual fucking morons out there and she had other priorities. <laughs> <laughs> what a great hat. You can get if you want to support what we do, by the way, please like, share and subscribe people who are listening. I uh, it costs far too much money. Um to actually come and do these events because we have to have security, we have to have travel. Um, and if you can support what we do, we want you to join us and wear beautiful items. Um, but it does, it, it just takes 
more money than you imagine just because I have to have uh, security. Um, and so if you can, go to letwomenspeak.org. There are many ways dangerous ribbons. Uh, there are many ways to support us. You can either be the billboard, you can wear your words, uh, or you can simply donate. But we really want you to be part of what we do. And another way you can be part of what we do, uh, or what I do, is to join the party of women so we can get more women, or people, women. Um, but we don't discriminate, but we want women. Um, who can come and uh, represent us in local government, um, PCCs, to run for a PCC, and their elections are this year, it costs £5,000. Um, for an MP, it just costs 500 uh, And I want every single person, if you're brave enough to come here, you're surely brave enough to put your name on a bit of you know, ballot paper um, and represent. And it might not be that you get picked, but the beautiful thing is, we will disrupt and we will change conversations that exclude us into ones that can't ignore us and that is the point of party of women um, and people have said what are your other policies do i need do we need other policies besides we know the truth and we're not afraid to speak it because uh, i don't think so and then someone said yeah but what if they say about funding in the nhs and i said well if you reduce the number of days that a woman spends in hospital by making her stay uh, stress-free, by making sure she's in a female-only environment, she'll leave the hospital sooner. And then you save the NHS some money. If you stop paying out to nonsensical surgeries, you save the NHS money. If we stop the mutilation of children, you save the NHS money. If you make a woman's environment less vulnerable when she gets home and you can insist her intimate carer who comes to see her I am on fire Someone's been misgendered um, if, if a woman can leave hospital and not block a bed because there is a safe place for her to go next We'll save the care system and the NHS money. I want every woman to understand that we are enough of an issue. Our lives are enough of an issue. Everywhere we want to be safe, with dignity, uh, that's a good enough issue for you to defend it as vociferously as you would if it was one of your children. And I think if we can start doing that, that our, us, we, women, are enough, then we will solve this issue just a little bit quicker. And if we've been thinking that for the last decade, it may never have happened in the first place. Okay, there was someone else that was going to speak. Charlotte? 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 She's got pink hair. She doesn't like to be noticed. <laughs> I'm Charlotte. Never seen her run. to women on the same footing as men. But here in this learned city, where women fought for equal opportunity to expand their minds, there are today women living in fear. The culture within universities has become corrupted, so that freedom of thought and robust academic practices are replaced with ideology and groupthink. 
We've witnessed the silencing of professors who challenge the prevailing narrative in cases like Kathleen Stock, where noisy and aggressive student activists, case in point, use intimidation tactics to try to silence them. It would be easy to assume that all students are just as hopelessly indoctrinated as our friends across the park over there. But Let Women Speak has been to many university towns. And every time we discover students who do not believe the gender nonsense, they are so grateful to see us because they thought they were alone in the knowledge that women don't have penises. Yeah. They're not alone, of course. There are countless others like them, horrified at the lack of academic freedom, but simply too scared to speak up. They feel the difficulty of swimming against the tide when they are still relatively young and inexperienced themselves. The tragic irony is that the place where they have come to learn and expand their minds is actually stifling them instead. But it's an even bigger danger to society at large. For once we realise that we cannot trust the experts, progress halts. To move forward, society follows in the footsteps of those who came before us. We learn what they learned without having to blaze a trail, so we might move further along the path than they did. But when we cannot trust the trail they have left, we must each rebeat it for ourselves. And we cannot advance as a society. And so we stagnate and regress. Many of you here know this feeling well. We have had to sacrifice time on our own careers, interests, and relationships, so that we can step in where our institutions have failed. We have had to read countless scientific documents, learn statistical analysis, become researchers, archivists, and orators so that we can demonstrate the truth that we all knew all along. That humans cannot change sex. That gender is just harmful, sexist stereotypes. <laughs> this has been a week of, of vindication and horror for many of us, as the cast review laid bare the failures of our institutions. The turfs were right! Yay! But we have a long way to go yet. So keep asking questions. Keep doing your homework. Because the next test is just around the corner. Yes, police officers. They're literally, there's police escorting football fans through the park to protect those assholes over there. Now, why is that? I, I just, there have been claims recently that we don't do enough with the police. We really do work very hard to ensure that we have good relationships with the police. We're often given a um, a liaison officer and what happened in Edinburgh and what happened in other places is police just don't give a shit about women. They see us as the aggressors. They're dehumanising language. And that's, look, there's police training which encourages people to boo when my name is read out. So this goes on like professional, um, I say professional, in police training um, this goes on that they are encouraged to see people like myself as aggressors and all of you turfy women as troublemakers. You know, because it, it's been such a troublesome event today. Um, and those people over there, they see as victims. You know, Jimmy, 54, knee high socks, um, his mum's pants, or usually his wife's knickers, or in Caitlyn Jenner's case, his daughter's underwear. Um, they see those men as vulnerable. You know, they talk about this most vulnerable minority. Do we think a man who has basked in the free labour of his wife, a 
and as his kids, and when his daughter goes through puberty, he thinks, but you know, after all this porn, all I want to do is dress like my daughter. Uh, and I can't keep it in anymore. Um, so I'm going to start wearing skin tight dresses that show my inadequate bulge. And I'm going to wear that out in public because I'm so vulnerable. I mean, that doesn't say vulnerable to me. Vulnerable says to me, stay at home. Don't go out. Stay silent at work. Don't speak up. Like hold your breath when there's a man in your space because you just feel too afraid of what he's going to do. And for my good friend Peter in America, I've done karate. Um, and still I don't feel that I could defend myself against an 18 stone man who wanted to do harm. Or even a 9 stone man who wanted to do harm. Because they are infinitely stronger than us. And they can overpower us even if they do get the girls to bang the drums, uh, like over there. Um, if you want any further explanation of biological sex, just look around and see who does the work in the old trans activist crowd. Uh, and you'll find the men standing still. And the woman, even sometimes with strangulated testosterone-fueled voices, uh, are doing a lot of the shouting. And when they're not, it's the men going, trans women are vulnerable. <laughs> We're so vulnerable. Um, but anyway, let's remind you, um, the opposite protest is sponsored by um, right creepy predators. That's an RCP flag, I think that's what it means. Um, the Communist Party, uh, Palestine, um, Unite Union, and then I think it must be uh, the Illiterate Society have come out with some handmade uh, protest banners. But anyway, this is what we came to do. We came to say, I'd like anybody else to speak. No woman has a penis! younger people in this crowd because you've got a whole lifetime of this having to be unraveled where many of your friends will pretend that they never went along with it in the first place in fact many of us will so if you can continue to stand with courage even when you are genuinely afraid then I promise we will win if you can come out speak up Maybe do tell your younger brothers that they're idiots. Uh, then I promise we will win. And do you know why else we're going to win? Why? Because...